Chapter Ten of Persuasion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Persuasion, by Jane Austen. Chapter Ten. Other opportunities of making her observations could not fail to occur. Anne had soon been in company with all the four together often enough to have an opinion, though too wise to acknowledge as much at home, where she knew it would have satisfied neither husband nor wife. For while she considered Louisa to be rather the favourite, she could not but think, as far as she might dare to judge from memory and experience, that Captain Wentworth was not in love with either. They were more in love with him, yet there it was not love. It was a little fever of admiration, but it might— probably must, end in love with some. Charles Hayter seemed aware of being slighted, and yet Henrietta had sometimes the air of being divided between them. Anne longed for the power of representing to them all what they were about, and of pointing out some of the evils they were exposing themselves to. She did not attribute guile to any. It was the highest satisfaction to her to believe Captain Wentworth not in the least aware of the pain he was occasioning. There was no triumph— no pitiful triumph in his manner. He had, probably, never heard, and never thought of any claims of Charles Hayter. He was only wrong in accepting the attentions, for accepting must be the word, of two young women at once. After a short struggle, however, Charles Hayter seemed to quit the field. Three days had passed without his coming once to Uppercross, a most decided change. He had even refused one regular invitation to dinner— and having been found on the occasion by Mr. Musgrove with some large books before him, Mr. and Mrs. Musgrove were sure all could not be right, and talked with grave faces of his studying himself to death. It was Mary's hope and belief that he had received a positive dismissal from Henrietta, and her husband lived under the constant dependence of seeing him to-morrow. Anne could only feel that Charles Hayter was wise. One morning about this time, Charles Musgrove and Captain Wentworth being gone a shooting together, as the sisters in the cottage were sitting quietly at work, they were visited at the window by the sisters from the mansion-house. It was a very fine November day, and the Miss Musgroves came through the little grounds, and stopped for no other purpose than to say that they were going to take a long walk, and therefore concluded Mary could not like to go with them, and when Mary immediately replied, with some jealousy at not being supposed a good walker, "'Oh, yes! I should like to join you very much. I am very fond of a long walk.' Anne felt persuaded, by the looks of the two girls, that it was precisely what they did not wish, and admired again the sort of necessity which the family habits seemed to produce, of everything being to be communicated, and everything being to be done together, however undesired and inconvenient. She tried to dissuade Mary from going, but in vain, and that being the case, thought it best to accept the Miss Musgrove's much more cordial invitation to herself to go likewise, as she might be useful in turning back with her sister— and lessening the interference in any plan of their own. "'I cannot imagine why they should suppose I should not like a long walk,' said Mary, as she went upstairs. "'Everybody is always supposing that I am not a good walker, and yet they would not have been pleased if we had refused to join them. When people come in this manner on purpose to ask us, how can one say no?' Just as they were setting off, the gentlemen returned. They had taken out a young dog, who had spoilt their sport, and sent them back early— their time and strength and spirits were, therefore, exactly ready for this walk, and they entered into it with pleasure. Could Anne have foreseen such a junction, she would have stayed at home. But from some feelings of interest and curiosity, she fancied now that it was too late to retract. And the whole six set forward together in the direction chosen by the Miss Musgroves, who evidently considered the walk as under their guidance. Anne's object was not to be in the way of anybody— and where the narrow paths across the fields made many separations necessary, to keep with her brother and sister. Her pleasure in the walk must arise from the exercise and the day, from the view of the last smiles of the year upon the tawny leaves and withered hedges, and from repeating to herself some few of the thousand poetical descriptions extant of autumn, that season of peculiar and inexhaustible influence on the mind of taste and tenderness, that season which had drawn from every poet, worthy of being read, some attempt at description, or some lines of feeling. She occupied her mind as much as possible in such like musings and quotations, but it was not possible, 
that when within reach of Captain Wentworth's conversation with either of the Miss Musgroves, she should not try to hear it. Yet she caught little very remarkable. It was mere lively chat, such as any young persons, on an intimate footing, might fall into. He was more engaged with Louisa than with Henrietta. Louisa certainly put more forward for his notice than her sister. This distinction appeared to increase, and there was one speech of Louisa's which struck her. After one of the many praises of the day, which were continually bursting forth, Captain Wentworth added, "'What glorious weather for the Admiral and my sister! They meant to take a long drive this morning. Perhaps we may hail them from some of these hills. They talked of coming into this side of the country. I wonder whereabouts they will upset to-day. Oh, it does happen very often, I assure you. But my sister makes nothing of it. She would as leave be tossed out as not.' "'Ah! You make the most of it, I know,' cried Louisa. "'But if it were really so, I should do just the same in her place. If I loved a man, as she loves the Admiral, I would be always with him. Nothing should ever separate us. And I would rather be overturned by him than driven safely by anybody else.' It was spoken with enthusiasm. "'Had you?' cried he, catching the same tone. "'I honour you.' and there was silence between them for a little while. Anne could not immediately fall into a quotation again. The sweet scenes of autumn were for a while put by, unless some tender sonnet, fraught with the apt analogy of the declining year, with declining happiness, and the images of youth and hope and spring, all gone together, blessed her memory. She roused herself to say, as they struck by order into another path, "'Is not this one of the ways to Winthrop?' But nobody heard, or at least nobody answered her. Winthrop, however, or its environs, for young men are sometimes to be met with, strolling about near home, was their destination, and another half-mile of gradual ascent through large enclosures, where the ploughs at work, and the fresh-made path spoke the farmer counteracting the sweets of poetical despondence, and meaning to have spring again, they gained the summit of the most considerable hill, which parted Uppercross and Winthrop, and soon commanded a full view of the latter, at the foot of the hill on the other side. Winthrop, without beauty and without dignity, was stretched before them an indifferent house, standing low, and hemmed in by the barns and buildings of a farmyard. Mary exclaimed, "'Bless me! Here is Winthrop! I declare I had no idea. Well, now, I think we'd better turn back. I am excessively tired.' Henrietta, conscious and ashamed, and seeing no cousin Charles walking along any path, or leaning against any gate, was ready to do as Mary wished. But, no, said Charles Musgrove, and, no, no, cried Louisa more eagerly, and taking her sister aside, seemed to be arguing the matter warmly. Charles, in the meanwhile, was very decidedly declaring his resolution of calling on his aunt, now that he was so near, and very evidently, though more fearfully, trying to induce his wife to go too. But this was one of the points on which the lady showed her strength, and when he recommended the advantage of resting herself a quarter of an hour at Winthrop, as she felt so tired, she resolutely answered, "'Oh, no, indeed! Walking up that hill again would do her more harm than any sitting down could do her good!' And in short, her look and manner declared that go she would not. After a little succession of these sorts of debates and consultations, it was settled between Charles and his two sisters, that he and Henrietta should just run down for a few minutes, to see their aunt and cousins, while the rest of the party waited for them at the top of the hill. Louisa seemed the principal arranger of the plan, and as she went a little way with them down the hill, still talking to Henrietta, Mary took the opportunity of looking scornfully around her, and saying to Captain Wentworth, "'It is very unpleasant, having such connections. But I assure you I have never been in the house above twice in my life.' She received no other answer than an artificial, assenting smile, followed by a contemptuous glance, as he turned away, which Anne perfectly knew the meaning of. The brow of the hill, where they remained, was a cheerful spot. Louisa returned, and Mary, finding a comfortable seat for herself on the step of a stile, was very well satisfied so long as the others all stood about her. But when Louisa drew Captain Wentworth away, to try for a gleaning of nuts in an adjoining hedgerow, and they were gone by degrees quite out of sight and sound, Mary was happy no longer. She quarrelled with her own seat, was sure Louisa had got a much better somewhere, and nothing could prevent her from going to look for a better also. She turned through the same gate, 
but could not see them. Anne found a nice seat 